Deputy Mayor Lou McDonald, please. Uh, Tisha, thousands of students are marching in protest from the Garden of Remembrance to the Dole today, protesting your government's failure to tackle the student accommodation crisis and the soaring cost of going to college. Students tell us that they are drowning in costs as they struggle to afford third level education and so many cannot find an affordable home near to their college. So they couch surf, they commute exceptionally long distances, or if they're lucky, they are forced to pay rip off rent. This is having a terrible impact on their education, their mental health and general well-being. And students feel that the accommodation crisis is robbing them of a future in Ireland. Students have been telling their stories to their union, the USI. One student says, it impacts my studies. I have to choose between buying my dinner or paying my rent. Another, I'm in a constant stress of how I will make enough to pay the bills. I haven't had a good sleep in two months. I'm constantly waking up, unable to focus and feeling helpless at times. Another says, I commute. I've lost out on my social life and I'm completely burnt out. Another three years left on my course and it feels like torture. Tishuk, the accommodation crisis faced by students is just one symptom of government's wider failure in housing. An entire generation locked out of affordable housing and home ownership, locked out of opportunity, locked out of a decent future. And on the watch of your government, any semblance of affordability has been torn to shreds. Record rents keep rising, sky-high house prices. The lack of affordable housing means we have students choosing between financial hardship or dropping out. Thousands of young adults find themselves stuck living at home with their parents, and many finally decide just to leave Ireland to have their chance at a better future. So they get their qualifications, they've done the training, and then they board the plane to Perth or Toronto or Boston. So it's little wonder that the crisis has become a barrier to employers hiring workers, schools hiring teachers, hospitals hiring nurses and doctors. And what has your government response been? Well, no urgency, no pace, no ambition. Your affordable housing delivery for the first six months of this year is paltry, a drop in the ocean of what is required to turn the tide. Neil on Gerakeim Lustin Maclean, Ock Leru Erin Vibe, De Hepena, Tehiok, Unrealtus, Arisha, Sarishella, Togol, Emedu, Ulwer, Er Holoher, Teher, Er Frice, Reasunta, Tastin, Realtus, O Ibraha, O Chowli, Ogaso, Vic Lane, O Kurhi, Dera, Leshung, Yerkem, Tehiok, Tishuk. Your 12 years in government is a story of Finnegale failure in housing. And what your government has been leaking so far, it appears that you'll continue that record of failure in next week's budget. Truth is, there needs to be a radical change of direction in housing. No more excuses, no more skirting around the edges of the problem. It's time to make housing affordable again for workers, for families, and for those students who are protesting today. And next week's budget must represent that change. That means providing investment necessary for a massive scaling up in the delivery of affordable housing. I want to know, will you commit to that essential funding, to a huge increase in funding in next week's budget? And can you specifically tell me, Taoiseach, what action you propose to take to address the student accommodation crisis? Thanks, Deputy, uh, for your question. Uh, and I'm very much aware of the uh, student protest that is taking place today. Um, in Ireland, uh, in 2023, there are more people attending third level in higher education than ever was the case in the past. People attending higher education and further education come from more diverse and more non-traditional backgrounds than ever was the case in the past. And students graduating today are more likely to get employment immediately after graduation than ever was the case in the past. And they're good things and things we should celebrate and progress that I think you should acknowledge. Uh, when it comes to the, the next budget, uh, I can guarantee you that students will not be forgotten. They weren't forgotten in the last budget. In the last budget, we reduced college fees, we increased the SUSE grant, we made it easier for people to get the SUSE grant, we extended the rent credit to students and to their parents, if it was their parents who were paying the rent. 
and that was worth more than €1,000 a year to most students. Uh, I acknowledge, of course, that student accommodation can be hard to find uh, and often can be very expensive. And we are ramp ramping up investment on, on, when, it comes to, when it comes to student accommodation. Compared to this time last year, there are 900 more student beds or student apartments than was the case. And that's in publicly funded institutions. If you add privately provided student accommodation, you can add another 2,000 to that. So just since this time last year, about 900 additional student beds in publicly funded higher education institutions and additional 2,000 uh, being provided by the private sector. We're also taking other actions. For example, rent a room, a very popular uh, scheme at the moment. People can rent out a room in their house or apartment and earn up to 14,000 without paying any income tax. Um, we've now changed the rules so that if somebody rents out a room uh, in their house or apartment to a student or to anyone else, uh, it doesn't affect their eligibility for a medical card. And Minister Bryan is working on proposals to extend that to people uh, who are in social housing. Uh, a lot are located very close to college campuses, a lot of spare rooms, uh, and his proposal is to uh, make sure that somebody who, who is in social housing can rent out a room without it affecting their rent uh, or their eligibility for a medical card. Uh, and we're also investing in purpose-built student accommodation. Um, just since 2016, only seven years, years or so ago, uh, the number of student beds, student apartments has increased by 13,000. Very considerable number. And as we speak, there are further 8,000 under construction. So what you're calling for us to do, Deputy, is already well underway. It's happening before your eyes, if you care to open them. Donald? My eyes are, are wide open, Taoiseach. Uh, and listening to you, you'd imagine that there's no problem at all. You'd scratch your head and you'd wonder why thousands of our young, brightest and best are mobilising on the streets today. Because according to the Taoiseach, there's no problem. According to the Taoiseach, it's not a problem that you commute for hours and hours to the extent that your social life is totally broken and your mental and physical well-being is compromised. According to the Taoiseach, it's not a problem that rents are at record highs and that students really struggle to meet these rents, Ken Corla. And you heard the young person saying they make the decision, do I eat or do I pay the rent? According to the Taoiseach, it's not a problem, it seems, that we are losing, again, a generation of talented, qualified people that we need here in this country to build Ireland. Apparently, that's okay, and it's all, according to you, Leo Varadkar, it's all going to plan. Now, that's in your world. See, in the real world, where people with their eyes open look and care to see the evidence before them, our young people are really struggling struggling to get basic accommodation so that they can pursue their study. And they come here to ask questions of you and your government as to what you will do. And it seems you're coming up blank Time for them. Now, That's WP. not good enough, Taoiseach. What will you do in next week's budget to make a real difference in these young people's lives? Yeah. Deputy, I acknowledge there is a problem. In fact, I said so in my earlier contribution. I said that student accommodation can be hard to find and can be expensive. And I set out exactly the actions that we've taken already to deal with that. And of course, we'll take more in the budget and beyond. Why did you seek to misrepresent what I said? Why did you seek to put words in my mouth? Because you are the great misleader, Deputy MacDonald. And I heard you do it, and I heard you do it earlier on as well. Again, pushing this, pushing this, pushing this, narrative, pushing this narrative that there is a mass one-way exodus of Irish citizens and Irish nationals and young people from our country. The truth is different, Deputy. For centuries, Irish people had to leave in huge numbers and didn't come home. It's different now. Yes, 80,000 Irish citizens, 80,000 Irish nationals, many of them young people, left in the past three years. But 90,000 came back. Why will you never say that? Because you don't want people to know the truth, because you are the misleader and you want to get your way into office by creating a false impression about, about our country and what it's like. Deputy Ivana Batchik, please. Please. 
Deputy Patrick. Everyone should have a home, and far too many in Ireland today do not. Housing must be a key priority for government in next week's budget, because housing is the civil rights issue of this generation. And indeed, it's affecting every generation. The housing crisis is affecting every community. It's why we're seeing students marching today with USI, calling for an increase in student accommodation. It's why we're all hearing from employers who can't recruit staff, schools which have teacher shortages, hospitals which can't retain healthcare workers, because of the housing crisis across across the country. And yet in this housing crisis, your government has allowed a culture to embed in our urban centres whereby we see the blight and scourge of dereliction and vacancy taking hold and becoming embedded. And your government not doing enough to address this. In some cases, the state is even contributing to dereliction and vacancy. Yet this week we saw an investigation by Fergal Blaney of the Mirror, which established that shockingly the HSE owns more than 250 empty buildings across the country. And I raised this with you yesterday. In my own constituency, these buildings include the Bagot Street Hospital, the Bride Street Medical Centre, Castle Street Clinic and part of the old Meath Street Hospital. Properties which, as the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation has said, could be repurposed to enable accommodation for healthcare workers and nurses struggling with the double whammy of a cost of living and housing crisis. We're seeing other government agencies too. I'm thinking of Department of Defence housing and barracks across the country that could be repurposed in a student accommodation crisis to provide much needed housing and homes for students. Yesterday when I raised the issue of vacancy with you Taoiseach, you acknowledged that under Housing for All there has been insufficient reduction in the number of HSE-owned properties that have been allowed to lie vacant. And I agree with you, the reduction has been insufficient. But frankly, the attitude of government agencies and departments to their own land and their own buildings shows a disrespect for those people at the sharp end of the housing crisis. The students marching today who cannot find accommodation near their college, the families who are, uh, who are languishing on waiting lists, on social housing lists at a time when more than 3,500 social housing units lie empty, the working adults stuck in childhood bedrooms well into their 30s and 40s, and of course the nearly 13,000 people who under your watch are accessing emergency accommodation because they're homeless. We need to do more, Taoiseach. We in Dublin Bay South Labour have been seeking to bring the Bagot Street Hospital back into use and we have received very little, uh, very little uh, by way of positive engagement on this from the HSE. And the sort of obfuscation we've had from the HSE it really shows a contempt for elected representatives and indeed it's an affront to everyone who is affected by the housing crisis. So Taoiseach, I want to know how your government is proposing to address the vacancy and dereliction issue, which should be one key way to address the housing crisis. Our national government should be leading from the front on this. So Taoiseach, what is the scale of the vacancy and dereliction problem in the property portfolios of state departments and public bodies? And will you introduce a more coordinated push on vacancy, on bringing buildings back into use as housing for students and nurses and others who are so desperate for housing? Will you introduce this from government, from central government? Please. Thanks, Deputy. This is one thing you're absolutely correct about. Uh, employers are struggling to recruit and retain staff. It's in the public sector and it's in the private sector. It's in big companies and small companies. It's well-paid jobs and poorly paid jobs. And the main reason for that, Deputy, is full employment. Um, unemployment in Ireland is in around 4% and most of the people who are un unemployed are in between jobs. In fact, many economists say that we're now beyond full employment. And that is the context in which um, uh, employers are, are, um, are, are struggling to recruit and retain staff. It is the main reason, not the only reason, but it is the main reason. Uh, just in relation to vacancy, Deputy, uh, you mentioned uh, vacant social housing. Um, roughly 2% of our social housing stock is vacant, and most of that is because it is being renovated, it is between tenants, uh, or it is earmarked for demolition as part of regeneration. Uh, it'll always be the case that one or two percent uh, of vacant property, of social housing properties are, are, are vacant. Um, the deputy will have the opportunity to answer, answer, ask a question, and I promise not to interrupt him uh, when he's asking his question. Uh, in relation to the HSE specifically, uh, my department uh, chairs a state lands and property subgroup, which monitors progress being made on this an action by HSC and other agencies and departments to transfer state lands to the Land Development Authority. There are 26 sites that, have ongo that are of ongoing interest to local authorities and are ready to progress to the next stages of investigation and determination. 
Every effort is being made to identify state properties and lands that can be repurposed to increase the supply of housing over the long term. To give some good examples, uh, Fingal County Council uh, is currently refurbishing 12 derelict cottages on St. Isaac's Hospital campus in Port Oran to bring them into use as social housing. St. Kevin's Hospital in Cork has been transferred to LDA ownership and the construction of 265 social and affordable homes on this public land has commenced and the first will be ready for occupation in 2025. So this is very much something that the government is working on, is prioritising and is, making, is, is taking action on. Uh, I represent the Labour Party, the party of work and of jobs. So there's no need to lecture our party on employment and full employment or even on being beyond full employment. But clearly what is holding back the creation of jobs in this country now is the lack of availability of housing. And it's holding back delivery of our public services like education and healthcare. And it's holding back our students who are trying to, trying to find somewhere close to their studies where they can live uh, in, in security. And they can't find it. And that's why they're marching today. Addressing vacancy and dereliction, particularly in public owned buildings, should be the low hanging fruit. One way to address the housing crisis that we're currently facing. Last night in Rathmines I hosted a public meeting with architect Duncan Stewart and, other, and local Labour representatives. People there had travelled from all over Dublin because they felt so passionately about the need to see concerted government action to tackle the scourge of vacancy and dereliction across their communities because we're seeing it in every urban centre and what we're not seeing is sufficient urgency and ambition from government to tackle this. You've given a few positive local examples that's welcome of where buildings are being brought back into usage. I know in Dublin City Council there are efforts underway to do the same but what we're lacking is a concerted central campaign from central government Thank to you, bring state-owned properties back into use for accommodation for students, for nurses and for Time workers who up, simply please. cannot afford to uh, cannot afford a place they can call home now. Ishuk. Thanks, Deputy. The approach we're taking to vacancy is one of carrot and stick. So, for example, we have grants that people can avail of to bring old buildings back into use, and about 4,000 applications are in for that already. We also set up a fund, €150 million, Euros, so that local authorities can purchase vacant properties and bring them back into use, and that is now happening uh, all over the country. And we're transferring state-owned properties to the LDA so they can be developed uh, for use for housing and other things. And on the other hand, now, there's a stick approach. The vacant property tax, which is coming into effect uh, over the course of the next few months, uh, and derelict site levies, uh, and actions such as that. And I think we're starting to see that move around the country, or at least certainly I am. Not to the extent that I would wish to see, uh, but I, I am seeing that happening on the ground now, Deputy, uh, and it is very encouraging. Uh, just in relation to, to the Labour Party being, being the party of work, that's fair enough. Uh, that's how you see yourself. But you've never achieved full employment in government. We have. It's this government that has brought about full employment. It's this government that has brought about uh, very significant increases in the national minimum wage and the move to a living wage. It's this government. It's this government that brought in uh, statutory sick pay. Thank it's you, this Keisha. government that brought in parental leave. We have a much better record when it comes to employment and workers' rights than the Labour Party ever does on any objective analysis. Please, Deputy Tadder, to the analysis. Please, please will you? that wrecked the economy and brought about huge unemployment in the Greenland. Please. 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 Uh, the original group raised uh, during the PMB time the issue of the crisis in Angarda Siakona uh, today. And I want to, to tackle the issue uh, myself as well. Um, I held a public meeting in Meads last week on the issue. It was uh, packed, standing room only, uh, and a large number of people attended, ordinary people, workers in the community, uh, and the stories that they told were incredible. Uh, situations where women working in shops and retail outlets were being threatened with rape or sexual assault uh, if they went to the Gardaí to identify people who were stealing within uh, those areas. People afraid to actually walk to the shops or places of work, only getting lifts and leaving uh, with lifts uh, only uh, as well. Um, and you know, criminal gangs taking slow motion crime sprees tr through the towns, you know, breaking into shop after shop over a period of 90 minutes uh, with a real feeling of impunity, a, a feeling that there was a, they had an immunity against 
uh, the Gardaí tackling them, uh, having the ability to tackle them, uh, or even that they would go to, to, to uh, court. One of the things I couldn't believe, one of the issues that is new to me, is that so many people were afraid to get involved in prosecutions against the criminals who were involved in this type of mayhem uh, because they felt that they would expose themselves to further threats and difficulties in, in the future. Um, there was that sense that uh, especially younger cr criminals did never felt that they were going to go to jail, that they would have multiple convictions, 20, 30, 40, uh, multiple convictions, uh, and still not see any jail time at all. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that we have reached a tipping point in many towns and villages and cities in this country in terms of the level of crime uh, and antisocial behaviour that's happening. And it's really important that you know, the, the figures back this up. You know, rape has, in, has doubled in the last 15 years in this state. Sexual assault has doubled in the last 15 years in this state. The murder rate has significantly increased this year. Violent crime is on the increase uh, in towns and, and villages. And one of the, the reasons that's happening is the fact that we have a Garda force that's on its knees at the moment. There's a direct correlation between the, the damage that's done, being done to the Gardaí and the increase and the spike in crime and antisocial behaviour uh, that's happening over uh, the last number of years. And, you know, I, I've said it to the Minister for Justice today, I took no pleasure from saying it, but for every year she has been Minister for Justice, there has been a decrease in the number of Gardaí in the state. We have one of the lowest number of police per capita in Europe currently at the moment, and yet those Gardaí are being attacked in their hundreds physically every year. They're resigning and they are uh, retiring in their hundreds every year and there's been a collapse in the number of new recruits coming into Temple Moor and morale. We don't have their back as a government. When will this government have the back of Gardaí on the beat and make sure that they are protected from the level of assault that they're receiving? Because Garda welfare is a key element you, of the issues that the Gardaí have with the Minister for Justice at the moment. Thank you. Please, Thanks, thanks, Deputy. Uh, this is a government that is tough on crime, and this is a government that is building stronger and safer communities. How are we doing it? Four ways. Increasing guard resources. The guard budget is €2 billion Euros for this year, the highest ever, and will be higher again for next year. Contrary to what the Deputy has said, uh, we'll recruit between 700 and 800 Gardaí this year, and in addition to that, uh, 400 uh, Garda staff. So we'll see Garda numbers stabilising this year and rising again next year. They did peak uh, back in 2021, let's not forget, which isn't that long ago. We still have more Gardaí today than we had five years ago. We're also in introducing tougher laws, and they've been introduced by Minister McEntee, uh, stronger sentences and longer sentences for serious crimes against individuals. And we're increasing the number of prison places. If we want hardened criminals who are a threat to society to serve their sentences, well then, do the maths. We need more prison places. And Minister McEntee has plans afoot to increase uh, the number of prison places by 600. And we're also dealing with the root causes of crime by developing community safety partnerships, a major innovation uh, introduced by Minister McEntee, now being piloted in various parts of the country and ones that we want to extend across the nation. That is plainly weak on crime and weak on the causes of crime, if you want to borrow the British Labour Party's uh, mantra uh, in, re in relation to this. This is a government and, and a minister for justice that has been distracted by the culture wars and have forgotten about the bread and butter issues that are actually affecting so many people in this country uh, currently. Um, it's just, you know, in, in my own county, for example, of Meath, there is a, a stretch from Enfields to Old Castle uh, to Nobber. Uh, on which on a Saturday night there is simply only six Garda available there. The nearest backup Garda is 40 minutes away from them. And that leaves those Garda uh, incredibly exposed in terms of them dealing with the difficulties uh, that they have. Um, I, I, I honestly believe that the, the government needs to very clearly state that those who purposefully injure a Garda will see uh, time in jail, a custodial sentence. There has to be a minimum sentence for those who actually attack or physically harm a Garda. And we need to make sure the Garda know that the terms, conditions and pay that Garda have will increase to make the job attractive so that young men and women will take up posts in that. Until those two things are done, Thank we you, are Deputy. going to see this crisis continue to our communities in this country. Thanks. Um, thanks, Deputy. I agree with you about Garda safety, and it's really important uh, that our Garda, and not just our Garda, uh, everyone feels safe uh, at work. Um, and that extends to 
all of our uniformed services extends to teachers, nurses, people working on our health service too, who often uh, face, uh, face the risk of violence, but particularly the case when it comes to our Gardaí. And that's why Minister McEntee has led the charge uh, on providing body-worn cameras for Gardaí. And that's really important for their protection. Um, and also uh, is, is, is making sure that there's improvements uh, in the uh, equipment that they have. Um, but Deputy, I'm not sure what you really mean by the culture wars, but if anyone's distracted by them, Deputy, it's probably you, uh, not, Minister, not Minister McEntee. I, I know Minister McEntee. I, I know Minister McEntee uh, from the time she was working in this building uh, as a PA to her father. I know Minister McEntee. I know what her number one priority has been as Minister and is cracking down on domestic and gender-based violence. And you just look at the murder and manslaughter statistics for this year. It's not, thankfully, gangland crimes this year. It's women being killed by men they know. It's and the worse. fact that she has made that a priority shows how serious she is uh, about the serious crime of gender and domestic-based violence. Thank you, Taoiseach. Uh, we go to the Rural Independent Group. Deputy Michael Collins, please. Thank you. Uh, Taoiseach, we often speak about the homeless here in the Dáil and the horror of young people getting eviction notices, which is a horrendous worry on anyone's mind. Taoiseach, now just think for one minute, being aged 70, 80 or 90 plus, and be in a nursing home and get an eviction notice. This has happened in August to 48 residents of a 68-bed nursing home in Belgoolie in Westcock, ran by a group called APRI Living. Many patients in this nursing home were notified before the families were to be out within six months, which would be February 2024. But in the last week, families are now being told that HICU are escalating the closure and intend to evict residents by October the 24th. I have been helping families over the past few weeks to try and find an alternative nursing home, but for the rema remaining 30 patients, this immediate eviction order is a step too far. On Tuesday, August the 8th, I appealed to the Minister for Responsibility for Nursing Homes, Mary Butler, to attend the public meeting, but she was unable to attend. On Saturday, 12th of August, I invited Minister Butler, Minister Michael McGrath, Minister Coveney, beside you there, and Minister Michal Martin to a public protest, as many of their constituents are residents in this home, but they didn't turn up. I again wrote to Minister Butler expressing the urgency of the matter, requesting her to meet with the families and with me as a local representative. And three or four weeks later, I get back a detailed reply on the 14th of September stating her support for Hickey's report, basically showing many areas of non-compliance. In the final line of Minister Butler's letter to me, she states she understands how distressed the residents, their families and staff are, but her priority remains the health and well-being of the residents. Tisha, where is the health and well-being of a patient being considered Considered here, as the Minister refused to meet with anyone to discuss solutions that could have been brought forward. Where is the health and well-being of the patients in the Department of Health who have no backup plan in cases like this of an emergency nursing home closure? Words of pity do not work here. Teachuk, how can a state lie idly by and have elderly residents basically thrown out of a nursing home where some have resided in for years and where some married couples are residing at this present time? Surely the state has responsibilities in these areas and must step in and take over the running of the nursing home when they close, whether this is because of financial difficulties or HICU issues. We can't just lie idly by and leave families and residents heartbroken as their loved ones face eviction on October the 24th. And it is eviction, and that's what it is. Talk about turning our backs on the most vulnerable in our society. Teacher, you must act also by launching an, also by launching an investigation on APRI Living's running of this and other nursing homes to ensure patients' care come first. I wore myself trying to communicate with APRI Living, read the Belgoolie closure, to be met with the iron door, refusing to meet, which to me is a statement in itself. Taoiseach, the residents, families and staff in APRI Living Nursing Home in Belgoolie are on tinderhooks eight weeks later. You contact APRI, they say they can't talk. Talk to the HSE. You ring the HSE, they say talk to HICU. You ring HICU and they don't want to discuss the matter and the department will kick the can every direction all this while the clock's ticking and 30 residents are facing eviction in a few weeks and have nowhere to go. Taoiseach, are you aware of this crisis in Belgooli Nursing Home? And if so, what is your solution for the residents? Will the HSE step in? This, this one-time 68-bed nursing home, which was ran brilliantly until APRI Living came on board, is now facing closure within days. We need answers. Thank you, Deputy. I just want to um, thank Deputy Collins for raising the very concerning issue of APRI living in Belgooli in, in County Cork, and I am aware of the issue. Uh, HICWA have engaged in a series of inspections to APRI nursing homes. Six of these are detailed in the publication of Thursday, 7 September. 
Across these facilities, the Chief Inspector is concerned about the registers, registered providers' ability to sustain a safe and quality service. There has been ongoing regulatory engagement between HICWA and APRI, including provider meetings and cautionary and warning meetings in relation to governance, management and fire safety. Further inspections have been completed over the summer period and further engagement with the group has taken place. Many of these are unannounced inspections, which are an important part of any effective inspection process. Inspections have un uncovered financial irregularities in relation to res residents' incomes within six of the nursing homes, and the Chief Inspector will use all powers available to her office to perform the necessary functions to investigate this under the Regulations and Health Act of 2007. And Ms. the Minister of Health and Mr. Butler are providing the necessary resources to do this. Inspectors, uh, in, the inspectors who visited Balgooli in particular were concerned about governance and management of the centre, especially when it came to residents' finances, the areas of continued non-compliance, particularly when it comes to fire safety management, uh, which had not been addressed by the provider. For this reason, a restrictive condition was attached to the registration of the centre back in March to stop any new admissions until fire safety works were completed. This condition was put in place to protect the current and any future residents. At the time of the most recent inspection, no substantial fire safety works had commenced. The report also found that other non-compliances from previous inspections uh, were also reviewed. Further action is necessary on infection control, staffing, care planning, healthcare nutrition, and residents' rights. Because of this, the Chief, Chief Inspector has cancelled APRI Living Balgooli's registration under Section 51 of the Health Act 2007 due to persistent non-compliance with the regulations and therefore the home will close on the 24th of October. Ensuring the welfare and safety of residents when a nursing home closes is essential, and the HSC have been informed and are working closely with, with the provider, residents and their families uh, to insist the residents to move to alternative nursing home accommodation. Uh, in May 2023, uh, the centre had 54 residents in situ. That is now down to 20, 22 who are still present, and work is being done to find alternative accommodation for them before uh, the nursing home closes on October 24th. Thank you, Tisha. Deputy Collins. Thank you. Uh, Reply. But I'm, I'm astonished to think that you said you knew about this, and obviously you and other ministers must know about this, but you have no solution. The nursing home is closing. There's 22 residents in that nursing home, you said, and they have no home to go to, and you have no backup plan other than someone will talk to someone. They, as far as I am uh, aware, uh, Tishuk, you are meant to give a six-month notice to patients. That's the very least. That's not even going to work here. They're being, they're being booted out after two months. And you're just going to stand idly by and allow that happen instead of some kind of a system needs to be set in place. Surely be the God this has happened somewhere else in the country. And are you just abandoning people because they're old people that can't speak for themselves? They can't stand up and say this is wrong. Hick, you have standards, and we have to respect the standards that are being met. But if they have to be met in community hospitals, funding is given by government to do that. Well, when it's met in nursing home, private operators can't afford some of these standards. But still, Hick, you have no standards when there's overcrowding, the CUH and overcrowding in Limerick Hospital and many more places. There's no worry about standards there. But there's standards here. But I don't mind we standing by standards. But these people need to have an answer here today. They cannot be waiting for three weeks' time to be wheeled out in a wheelchair, taken home or taken to a house maybe where there's nobody left there. Right, you, you. Are stand, you have turned your back on the people of Belgooni and its own. Thank you, Find, Thank Give me an answer if you haven't. Th 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 thanks, Deputy. Look, I understand that a lot of people, whether it's the remaining 22 residents uh, or their family members, are very concerned about the situation. I certainly would be. Uh, if it was my mother or grandmother. This nursing home has to be closed. HICWA doesn't cancel a registration lightly, I absolutely guarantee you that. And the fact they've given such short notice should indicate to you how serious this situation is. Uh, we're down to 22 residents. Uh, residents, their families have to be consulted and given appropriate notice so that new homes can be found uh, within the fair deal. Thanks. However, pending alternative arrangements, the HSC, either with the consent of the registered provider or if needs be by order of the district court, shall take charge of the designated centre and ensure safe and appropriate care for the residents. So what's being done at the moment is trying to find uh, appropriate alternative accommodation for the 22 remaining residents. But the power exists for, the, for ICWA to take over uh, the running of the centre if that's necessary, uh, and that is an option. Thank you, Thishik, and that concludes leaders' questions and takes us to questions.